Welcome back to another video here on the channel. In this one, I want to talk about the great definancialization that Bitcoin will bring. And I want to talk about the saying Bitcoin is not the bubble, but the pin to the bubble. This video is based on Bitcoin as the Great Definancialization by Parker Lewis, which is part 16, the latest part of his highly, highly recommendable series of articles called Gradually Then Suddenly. Have you ever had a financial advisor or maybe even a parent tell you that you need to make your money grow? This idea has been so hardwired in the minds of hardworking people all over the world that it has become practically second nature to the very idea of work. Financialization has been so errantly normalized that the lines between saving, not taking risk and investing, taking risk have become blurred to the extent that most people think of the two activities as being one and the same. How exactly did this happen? Well, it happened because saving was no longer a valid option. Saving fiat money doesn't make any sense because of the perpetual devaluation of the currency. In today's world, investing or earning more really are the only ways to make your money grow. Saving is not. By saving, you lose money, or rather you lose purchasing power. Bitcoin fixes this. The two operations have become so sufficiently confused and conflated that most people consider investments, and particularly those in financial assets, as savings. What resulted from the realization that your money loses value over time is this increasing financialization. Your money loses value, so there is a need to make your money grow, which then creates a need for financial products to make your money grow. This can only have one logical outcome. An over-financialized economy is the logical conclusion of monetary inflation, and it has induced perpetual risk-taking while disincentivizing savings. A system which disincentivizes saving and forces people into a position of risk-taking creates instability, and it is neither productive nor sustainable. It should be obvious to even the untrained eye, but the overarching force driving the trend toward financialization and financial engineering more broadly is the broken incentive structure of the monetary medium which underpins all economic activity. Make money through your day job, then put it at risk of loss through investment, just to keep up with inflation. Run hard, just to stay in the same place. Risk taking is not bad per se. Intentional and voluntary risk taking is even necessary for any economy. But being forced into taking risks is not healthy. The whole idea of money is that you can store the energy and time you expended for work in some form of medium that you can use in the future to get value with. But everyone has been forced to accept a manufactured dilemma. The idea that you must make your money grow is one of the greatest lies ever told. It isn't true at all. Central banks have created that false dilemma. The greatest trick that central banks ever pulled was convincing the world that individuals must perpetually take risk just to preserve value already created and saved. It is insane, and the only practical solution is to find a better form of money which eliminates the negative asymmetry inherent to systemic currency debasement. And of course, you already know what this better form of money is. Bitcoin. Before we can get into the great definancialization, we need to lay more groundwork of the great financialization. What money printing produced was malinvestments and a completely overfinancialized economy. In other words, a bubble. Everything has a monetary premium and becomes a form of money to store value, because the money itself, your currency, isn't working like it should. A zombie company is a company that earns enough to stay operational, but too little to pay off their debt. It is no surprise that the broken incentive structure leads to more and more of these companies. One would have to be blind to not see the connection. The necessary cause and effect between a money manufactured to lose its value, a disincentive to hold money and the rapid expansion of financial assets, including within the credit system. What's more is that this skews opportunity costs, which at the same time become harder to measure. It's clear that every economic decision point becomes impaired when money is not fulfilling its intended purpose of storing value. When you create the incentive not to save, do not be surprised to wake up in a world in which very few people have savings. A fiat world is a world run on debt. Most Americans don't just lack savings. The average debt per person is 90,000 US dollars. That's what I call stealing from the future. Now let's take a 180 degree turn and look at a world on a sound money standard. A money standard in which the money doesn't lose its value over time. When all spending decisions are evaluated against an expectation of potentially greater purchasing power in the future rather than less, investments will be steered toward the most productive activities and day-to-day -day consumption will be filtered with greater scrutiny. Consumption will go down, so will the percentage of male investments. The bubble would deflate. Zombie companies would die. Hyper-Bitcoinization is a gradual process, so saying Bitcoin is the pin to the bubble is not quite true. The bubble wouldn't burst. It would rather lose air over time, but faster than many people would like. I believe it would be a time in which many people lose their jobs, many companies go bankrupt and many livelihoods will be destroyed. This phase is certainly not pretty. But I do believe it's necessary to build a functional economy from there and to make saving money an option again. This is part of the great definancialization. 
Hyperbitcoinization is an individual process. It's really a voluntary decision to move from an inferior money to a superior money. So the impact is felt on an individual level as well. I definitely became much more of a saver and minimalist through Bitcoin. Do I still consume stuff? Of course, daily. But my consumption has become more conscious. The opportunity costs are not a one-way street anymore. The other side of the great definancialization is that investment options like ETFs would lose some relevance, because when our goal is to save money instead of investing, we won't need them anymore. Bitcoin would suck up the monetary premium of a lot of assets. Real estate is another example. Housing prices have gone completely insane over the last few decades. Mark Twain had this very profound quote, buy land, they aren't making it anymore. It's true, when you measure something that is finite in a currency that is infinite over time, the scarcity of land and housing leads to higher prices. That's not the main reason though. The main reason is huge companies being able to take on incredibly cheap credit to buy everything they can find and thereby create an artificially shortage. There is a clear and high monetary premium on real estate. Bitcoin will reduce that. Definancialization will principally be observed through growing Bitcoin adoption, the appreciation of Bitcoin relative to every other asset and the deleveraging of the financial system as a whole. To me, it's very interesting to see how many people still look at Bitcoin as just another investment vehicle, as another tool of financialization. To me, it's not. To me, it's simply a superior money. There is no dollar price where I would think of cashing out to go back to the dollar or euro. Because to me, Bitcoin is the better money. It's the exact opposite of fiat currency. It takes long-term appreciation and short-term volatility of a long-term depreciation and short-term stability. Keynesian economists believe that money needs to be inflated to not fall into a deflationary spiral in which no one buys anything anymore, because everyone just saves for the future. I don't know what to tell you, apply some common sense instead of economic modeling. While Keynesians worry that an appreciating currency will disincentivize consumption and investment in favor of savings and to the detriment of the economy at large, the free market actually works better in practice than it does when applying flawed Keynesian theory. High present demand for both consumption and investment is dictated by positive time preference and there being an express incentive to save. Everyone is always trying to earn everyone else's money and everyone needs to consume real goods every day. Given that time is inherently scarce and that the future is uncertain, even those that plan and save for the future with low time preference are predisposed to value the present or the future on the margin. Taken to an extreme just to make the point, if you made money and literally never spent a dime or a set, it wouldn't have done you any good. Consumption of course doesn't stop, it just becomes more conscious, which is easily a net positive in my eyes. What Bitcoin ultimately does to an economy is it provides a corrected incentive structure. I talk more about this in my video on hyperbitcoinization. To summarize, there is, and always has been, a fundamental difference between saving and investment. Savings are held in the form of monetary assets and investments are savings which are put at risk. The lines may have been blurred as the economic system financialized, but Bitcoin will unblur the lines and make the distinction obvious once again. What the future looks like exactly, no one knows, but Bitcoin will definancialize the economy and it will no doubt be a renaissance. Saving is common sense, or at least it should be. It's not anymore though. Bitcoin fixes this. And that's it for this video. For further reading, I would recommend the article that this video is based on. You can find the link in the video description. If you enjoyed it and also hopefully took something out of it, I would also appreciate it if you leave a like and subscribe to the channel for further content. Then I see you next time.